you know, a lot of what we're dealing with right now is a demand for the evolution of our language, you know, that like what we're going to, you know, in the same way that my interest in all of this stuff kind of arguably came out of reading a paper about where syntax comes from. The That's evolution, where it all started? Yeah, the evolution of syntactic language, um, this paper led by Martin Nowak. Um, Your recall of all these podcasts that you've recorded and all these papers that you've read is astounding. Thanks. Yeah, gobble noatropics, folks. That's just, um, <laughs> and cr- yeah, gobble crowd them. And- yeah, but, so this piece, uh, Nowak and Plotkin... Uh, oh, and no, 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 Krakauer r- r- worked on this one too, but he's got a couple uh, on the evolution of language and of syntactic communication. Oh, here we go. Um, oh, look at that. Henry G worked on this episode of uh, this issue of Nature, my buddy Henry. Anyway, so uh, they talk about syntax and the sentence mm-hmm. being uh, something that emerged out of a similar kind of catastrophic threshold in information production in early human society, like hominid society, where you, uh, the complexity of society meant that we had suddenly, you know, a, a, uh, exponentially more things to communicate to one another that mattered to the cohesion of our, of our behavioral coordination. And so, our language, which at the time was built on individual utterances, where like we didn't have sentences yet. We had things like chair, you know, or like uh, good, Mm. you know, and there was no real, um, you know, there was no way to articulate things into longer, more complex ideas. The way a toddler communicates. Right, right. And and then at some point, uh, you get to the, you get to a, a level of social complexity where the, the, you need to remember more words than you can, basically. And so at that point, we go from a dynamic where you learn by adding new words to a dynamic where you come up with a, a handful of simple rules where those words can be combined to mean exponentially more things than you can actually remember. And so, like, this is the, you know, this is, this has implications to the origin of life because what we're talking about and what um, my, my friend Sarah Walker, who's a, an astro, a NASA, uh, funded astrobiologist at ASU uh, talks about that life is basically the s- life can be defined as the processes whereby systems generate a greater uh, possibility space than the actual space of things that can happen. So, like you know, the notion that are that we are evolving into a deeper and deeper embrace of imagination and possibility is actually like fundamental to what it means to be alive and what it means to be intelligent. Um, you know, when like people talk about life as being, uh, you know, imp- like highly improbable, you know, like the number of ways that you can put a mo- you know, molecules together to make something and only some of them will actually lead to a reproducing cell and, you know, vastly more of them won't. And the question of like, well, how is it that we did this? The famous sort of critique of, uh, you know, that it's like a junkyard blowing, you know, a tornado blowing through a junkyard and assembling a working 747. It's like, it's actually <laughs> substantially worse than that. But you have people uh, like my buddy Bruce Damer um, or like the quantum biologist John Joe McFadden at the University of Surrey who have interesting arguments for basically not only life being, uh, you know, seemingly circumventing enormous improbability, but being inevitable because uh, the the grain of our cosmos is toward an expansion of what um, complex system scientist uh, Stuart Kaufman calls the adjacent possible. That like, you know, you, you keep coming to these, these uh, crisis points in information management in both pre- biological, biological, and, and sort of trans or post-biological systems. And the solution is to invent a new syntax, a new, a new order uh, for articulating and recombining the, the parts that allow us to model the cosmos with adequate complexity in order to continue surviving in it. And so, yeah, so like this, this notion of, um, of we're, us being at a point now 
in the history of the planet where subject verb object syntax is no longer adequate mm. to describing the reality of our experience such that we can say things like I am in the room and the room is in me and for it to make sense intuitively rather than it to sound like a nonsense statement. Right. Um, I did a, there's a video on that uh, folks can find on my YouTube, how to resolve a paradox where, you know, then this is something that was communicated to me in a UFO experience actually in 2006, where they said, look, if you, if you, uh, you know, like say you have a, a card and on one side of the card, it says the statement on the opposite side of this card is false. But then you turn the card around and on the other side of the card, it says the same thing. So they can't both be right, right? <laughs> right? Oh no, but they can because you can spin the card. And so you can assign a relative truth value to this, to these seemingly contradictory statements by adding a dimension, a dimension of time or a dimension of physical space where those things can oscillate. And that kind of oscillation is one of the core characteristics of a hyper object as defined by Timothy Morton. So like reality is a hyper object and we gain more and more accurate High, more and more adequately high dimensional understandings or models of reality by adding more dimensions and more perspectives to our understanding, which is exactly what we were talking about with like, what is science? Science is an open-ended process whereby more and more seemingly contradictory dimensions are unified at the level of our understanding and our, our world models. And so that actually exceeds Th like a third person confirmation like really i think like the new form of science that we're going to stabilize at you know in the next in the coming decades is a science that is comfortable with the complementarity of both quantitative and qualitative evidence streams and has found some way to to unify them in a higher logical order and so yeah so it gets you know all of the stuff we've been talking about today is like how do we how do we use systems of numbers and systems of experiences stereoscopically to train our our scientific investigations on something that is fundamentally challenging to the idea of mind matter duality mm. wild shit dude what let's watch this video <laughs> i mean sure it's kind of uh Yeah, this is just me doing a mural on the inside of my buddy's camper. But Oh, okay. And you're just talking about this idea yeah. while you're doing your mural. Yeah, I've got a ton of these time-lapse videos online with me going on about one thing or another, philosophical ideas. Oh, this was... That's incredible. So you, so you said you got that idea in a UFO experience in 2006. Yeah. Yeah, they, the, this, uh, the second of four uh, UFO experiences I had at Clinton Lake outside of the... Lawrence, like where I went to school at the University of Kansas. How four, did the idea come? Of how did the idea get communicated to you? Well, it said, um, like, imagine that, like, we're going to use a geometric analogy to present this to you. They're like, okay, now okay. imagine you have a question. No, I mean, how was this coming to you? Like, just is showing up in my head while I was looking at this at, UFO. You're looking at something, and this is just popping in. These pic yeah. pictures are popping into your head, or words? Both. Um, and it, it was like, okay, so like, imagine you have a, a question and we're going to say that the question is like the formal logical presentation of this question is as a triangle. The answer to the question is a tetrahedron. You add another point that's off the plane at which you can't understand what you're being asked. And then you're able to observe the two dimensional plane from the third dimension. And they're like, so the, the tetrahedron poses a question that can only be answered by a four dimensional extrapolation from that. And so like all of our, you know, all of our physics models are like low dimensional encodings of the actual complexity of reality. Um, and our, the ability, like the, uh, the ability of human beings to cognize a certain number of dimensions is constrained by our evolutionary history, which required us to navigate space time uh, at a certain yeah. level of complexity, right. right? Like you don't need to know that there are 11 dimensions because it doesn't matter to you kind of, right. you know, it doesn't matter, but maybe now it's starting to matter. Mm. Maybe now we have an existential 
uh, demand being made on us to understand things at a higher level of dimensionality because our our actions are suddenly, uh, you know, re- they have repercussions that extend into other dimensions, you know? And so, like, there's a great book, Andrew Smith. This is sound kind of like what, Steve, you remember what Billy Carson was showing us that video about crystals and the lady that was holding the... She was hold, holding like the 3D thing, and it cast a shadow on the ground of like a 2D, Chris, a 2D shape. Yeah, that was it. Was a really good explanation as well. It was, was uh, uh, fuck, what was it? It's like ultra crystals, or uh, I forgot the name. Quasi crystals. Quasi. Yes. Yeah. So uh, Andrew Smith wrote Andrew P. Smith wrote a book about this called "The Dimensions of Experience." I want a book club with future fossils folks at some point, um, where he says basically like an ant actually doesn't even experience three spatial dimensions because they're so small, uh, it doesn't matter, and they can, like, walk on walls and stuff. Mm. So they really only experience X and Y. Their physical, their experience of physical space is planar. It's not cuboidal. Um, And humans have gotten to a point where we, you know, humans and, and birds, like, for instance, birds actually have more advanced spatial cognition than humans do because they have to fly. And so they're, they're, you know, birds, especially birds that live in forests and other dense areas have a uh, very advanced space. Like that's why corvids, you know, crows and magpies and so on are so good at salt, like picking locks and stuff is because they've, they have to think in 3d in order to navigate. And that's why humans, you know, we have, you know, we have really good, uh, stereoscopic vision and, you know, uh, we can manipulate objects with our hands and so on. Cause we were living in the trees for so long, you know, we had to, we had to swing through, yeah. a, you know, a kind of dense, complicated three-dimensional space. And so like, by the time we, you know, one of the things that, um, years ago, uh, the author of Xenolinguistics, which is like one of the best books on psychedelics and, and the evolution of language in the world, uh, Diana Reed Slattery, um, when she was on Eric Davis's show, Expanding Mind, back in the day, she talked about how like all of human language is based on us living on the surface of a planet under one gravity, one Earth gravity, mm. and that language would look completely different if it had emerged in zero gravity, mm-hmm. because you know you would think of things growing out rather than growing up. You know they would be growing out uniformly from a point right. in all you know in all directions mm-hmm. rather than you know like the way that like George Lakoff and Mark Johnson write in this metaphors we live by, they write about, uh, you know, we have this uh, relationship in our minds between more is up and then like, you know, a bigger pile of food is, is like better or like sitting upright means that you're kind of more, you know, you're maybe a little happier than if you're kind of like slouched over. So there's like these, there are very, very deep entailments between more is up and up is better that are in our language. So when we talk about the stock market, we talk about it going up when it's performing well right. and we talk about it going down when it's not. And like, it's really counterintuitive to try and flip it around. You know, one of the most interesting things about like data visualization and like the presentation of scientific knowledge is the way that we, we, we take these things as inherently objective, but they're actually, again, this is the postmodern or linguistic turn in philosophy. It's like, we're actually sitting on this incredibly deep substratum of embodied understanding that's coloring everything we take to be objective knowledge, Mm -hmm. you know? So like, you know, like uh, when people talk about getting the cold shoulder, it turns out that social rejection is registered in the brain in the same place that like, uh, you know, like you, you feel physical pain from social rejection and it feels cold and people report themselves as being colder when they're rejected. Mm -hmm. And there's like a history between like, you're a mammal, you slept in piles You know, you were like warmer when you were like accepted by your tribe or whatever. So like our language is full of this stuff. That's fascinating. Um, And so again, like where, you know, what's inside, 